good. Beer is good. Beer is good. And stuff. Welcome to episode two. Last time you saw us, we checked out the Sanford Homebrew Shop. We actually picked up some ingredients to do a homebrew, and today we're actually going to start that process. And John's going to show us the equipment. Yeah, I'm going to show basically all the equipment you need to make an all grain beer batch. It's, um, there's ways to do it. You can do extract all grain. Today we are going to be showing the all grain method, uh, going all over all the equipment that you need and how much it's going to cost. Yeah, this one isn't very simple. This is a couple different mashes. A little bit complicated. A little crazy. But, you know, it's it's all the same principles though. It's a good thing. I mean, as complicated as beer can get in the end, it's like anything else. It, goes down to the simple basic rules and if you know those that's all you need to know. Great, so stick around and check it out. Alright, so up next we have the Grand Reserve 17. Grand Reserve 17 is classified as an extra strong dark ale and is brewed by the Unibrew Brewery in Chambly, Quebec, Canada. It was first brewed in 2007 to celebrate the brewery's 17th anniversary. However, due to its popularity, it has seen a limited release every year since. It has an ABV of 10%, an SRM of 32, an IBU of 35, rate beer rates it at 99, and Beer Advocate gives it a 94. Uh, Grand Reserve 17 is actually one of my favorite brewers of all time. I've had it before since 2011, but uh, I think it's well deserved of its 95 and 98 uh, rankings. But uh, for this video, let's give it definitely a, uh, a nice full ranking and go from there. Yeah, it'll be the second or third time I've had this, so maybe my opinions have changed since I've had a couple different ones. So. Yeah. Well, it's a strong dark ale, first of all. So uh, strong dark ales are, in my opinion, between a double and a quad. It's got notes of strong dark candy, you know, malts, very little hot presence should be in there, just like a quad mm -hmm. or a double. So you're going to notice it maybe a little bit, but nothing like crazy like an IPA or anything. It's very subtle. And I think the Grand Reserve 17 does that, but we will know for sure when we give it a tasting. Yeah. Again, he's got the goblet, I got the tulip, and I think his head is holding him much longer than mine is, but you know, I still like the tulip first. Okay. So appearance wise, nice mahogany color, brown, and I don't know how it gets a 32 SRM, but I guess maybe that has to do something with this opaqueness, because I can't yeah. see anything through it. Yeah, it's definitely brown, not so, quite black. It's very very mahogany. 30, 25 is black, anything over 25 is black. Is exactly. that saying? Yeah, so. So it must be something with the opaqueness. Maybe right. we'll know a little bit more researching. The smell, mm, nice, uh, nice fruitiness to it. I smell some of that booziness coming off mm -hmm. it at the ten percent, which is reasonable. It's expected to have that. Um, it actually smells nice though. Really, this smells good. Mm -hmm. Besides that, I mean, I smell the fruit, the booziness, and the yeast slightly. It has that Unibrew unique yeastness to mm -hmm. it. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but it's definitely you can tell it's a Unibrew. It is fruity, like very like. I don't see citrusy, but there is certainly like a uh, very fragrant fruit for yeah. sure. Lighter, lighter fruit than I expected. I was expecting some of those like dark raisins, plums, and stuff. I almost want to say that. like fruity pebbles, almost like a fruity pebbles kind yeah. of smell to it. Citrusy, yes, yeah. exactly. Like almost like a orange mix in there, but I don't think there is. So let's give it a taste and go from there. Cheers. What are you thinking? I mean, it's a Unibrew beer. It definitely tastes like a Unibrew beer if you're familiar with Unibrew at all. Um, I guess that's their yeast strain. Whatever gives it that flavor, that Unibrew, it's definitely Unibrew. Yeah, yeast can generally give off a lot of strong flavors and sometimes not so strong of flavors. And this one, I think you're right, Unibrew's yeast strain definitely adds to the flavor. I, de I can taste that smokiness that's in mm -hmm. there, but I'm a big smoke fan. Um, something about smoky beers I just like. I don't know what it is. Maybe it just reminds me of something. Um, I taste the fruit. I taste uh, the candiness to it. I mean, the, the citrus still lingers a little bit. Yeah. Um, give it one more taste, but if you want to say something, you can do that while I'm tasting that. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, we, we've talked about it before. I'm not a big fan of the, the smoked or the, the oak kind of beer. Some of them are okay. I don't mind some of the rum cast kind of stuff. That kind of tastes good, but I mean, it's a good beer overall for sure. Again, it's just for me that that smokiness is gonna it's gonna put me off pretty much every time. Like it's, it's drinkable. I'm, I'm gonna finish it for sure, but um. Again, it's not something I'm going to go out of the way to, uh, to chase down again. Which, again, we kind of overlooked that aspect. This is another beer, again, as we mentioned before, 
that did kind of start the beer chaser mentality. Right, yeah. I called about five different places till I found Big Season in Orlando that actually had it. Everywhere else was like, we're getting it. We just sold out. Yeah. So it was not an easy beer to find. I think it was about $14, $15 a bottle, yeah. which isn't too bad seeing as no. most wines, was it 750 milliliters? Yeah, it's, a, it's the same exact size of a wine bottle with the same amount of alcohol. Yeah. You know, that's not too unreasonable, really. And I think it's one of my favorite beers, but again, I like smoky and you know, the strong Nargale flavors that are involved. So to me, yeah. it's a seriously good beer. To me, it's like a terrible, it's a terrible plus. Like I can definitely tell that it's taking kind of the terrible quadruple kind of mentality and maybe taking it a step further with that extra strong dark ale. Yeah. But again, the smokiness to me, and again, it's, it's not a bad beer. Like I, I'm probably gonna rate it kind of high, but it's not something I'm probably gonna go out and seek again. Yeah. I would drink it again. If you offered it to me and that's all you have here, if it was this or Budweiser, believe me, that down. I'm going after the <laughs> Yeah, I like the mouthfeel on it. It's a nice middle-of-the-road mouthfeel. It's not too crisp. It's got good carbonation and good lacing, even on my glass. Mm -hmm. I mean, his glass is crazy. Um, but the, the, the mouthfeel is nice. It's not overwhelming like a stout. And, you know, it's, it's not like a lager. It's a nice in-between. It lingers, but not too long. It's yeah, I agree. Long. I think it's a really good mouthfeel. So I, I like the mouthfeel a lot. So given a ranking, I would say for the appearance, I mean... To me, it looks beautiful. It's a mahogany. It's a nice color. I'm gonna give that a four out of five. I mean, I'm sure there's room to improve because you know I like the head on it. It's a nice creamy, but I think there's a little bit of room for improvement. Uh, the nose. Let me give one more shot of this. It's a. I could. I could. I wish there was a little more nose to it. It's. A little, it's just lingering. It's something I can't describe. Um, I want to give it a three out of five. I don't know why, but it's just it's one of my favorite beers. But this, this the, the nose is just not there. I thought it was more last time, but that's why I try beer again on you know to review uh, the taste. When you drink it, when you first get is a sweetness, which is what I want out of a strong any kind of Belgian dark beer. I want a strong like fruitiness up front. And then that yeast comes in the middle there, like that biscuity, weird unibrew yeast, which I personally like, and the smokiness is there too. And then finally that bitterness trickles. So to me, it's got everything a good beer should have, the sweetness up front, smoky yeast, and then finally the bitterness. So I'm going to give that, I think, the taste of 5 out of 5, but I love okay. this beer personally. Okay. Uh, mouthfeel, I think a 4 out of 5 is reasonable since it, like, you know, it has that nice coating in the mouth. Not too overbearing, though. Overall, I give Unibrew Grand Reserve 17. I'm gonna give it a 4.5 out of five. Not quite perfect. Right. One of my favorite beers, though, to be honest. Better like, nose probably would have pushed it up a little higher. Exactly. If I had the nose up there, I would have given it a near a five. But uh, 4.5, I think, is a reasonable to give that beer. All right. So me overall, you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of Unibrew. I really like everything they do. Um, La, La Fin du Bon, definitely the, one of the best triples out there. You know. But um, again, for me, it's hard to say because I, I want to be unbiased, but I'm going to be biased here. I don't necessarily like the smokiness of the beer. Um, so for me, that's going to put it down a little bit. Um, I'm going to give it an 8. Still a really great beer. I think anybody who likes quads, anybody who likes smoked kind of beers or oak aged beers is really going to enjoy this. Um, and again, it's kind of special. You can only get it every so often. So, you know. Yeah, I think generally it comes in the springtime, wintertime, they say. Mm -hmm. But every time I found it, it's generally in the springtime. Like March, April comes out of Florida. And that just might yeah. be because we're like way on the exactly. coast. We know what beer, yeah. real good beers come till the yeah. end. It slowly trickles so, out here. We finally get it. Maybe so, in California, Washington, you'll get it like in wintertime, like December. Who knows? Right. Yeah, I think it brews in December every year. So, you know, it takes a little while to get down here. But, but I'll give it an eight. Again, solid. Nothing, you know, um, I'm not going to go chasing two, three hundred miles to find this one beer like I would maybe a West Flutter in 12. That's right. Or a Westy 10 or 12. Is it West 12? 12, like if, yeah. If the 12 is around within 300 miles of here, me and you are taking a road trip. We're on a road trip there. Would you do that for this? Probably, Probably not. So, <laughs> let me give it an 8. Yeah, so there call. you go. Grand Reserve 17. There it is. All right, so here we are in John's Man Cave. We're getting ready to brew our St. Bernardus 12 Cologne. But uh, before we did that, we wanted to go over some of the equipment you used to brew. So uh, take it away, John. All right, well, first thing you're gonna need to do an all grain batch is a, uh, some sort of thing to heat the water up enough. Most stove tops can't do that. So what I have is a 10 year old turkey fryer my dad gave to me. It's a piece of junk, but it does the job. You can buy a $100 one if you want, doesn't matter. Um, here's just a funnel. We're not gonna use this for the boiling process, but it's a really nice thing to have. I say it's a necessity. Um, what we have here is a thermostat inside there. These are about $5, $10. Uh, it just keeps, you know, good to maintain your temperature. 
Got a lighter here that light, obviously light this propane tank. They are going to be using Zephyr Hills water today. What the we like the taste of Zephyr Hills, so that's the main thing of beer is use the water you like the taste of. So if you like Zephyr Hills, we're going to use that. Stirring paddle, probably five or ten bucks at local brew shop. Another must to have, you know, got to have that. Then next, this is all going to be using for the for the mashing to heat up the water and the boiling. After we do that, we're going to move to the mash tun, which as you see is an igloo cooler. But I fit it onto it is a uh, thirty dollars stainless steel spigot. You can get bronze, but stainless steel is preferred. It's worth the extra couple dollar investment. And right now inside of this is just uh, some sanitized water, but you need a igloo cooler or some sort of cooler because when you're mashing, you need that temperature to stay the exact temperature you want for that. So it's usually 155, 140 in that range. You can't do that with, the, with stainless steel because it's a conductor, so it's gonna you know lose temperature, gain temperature, all that stuff. This is a uh, bottle of star sand mixed with water. It's really helpful. I'm like, oh, I need to sanitize this real quick. It's really helpful so you don't have to make a whole batch. Hydrometer, which will be used in later, but it's good to have, you know, definitely a necess necessity. But here is a just a 50 cent pitcher, half gallon pitcher. I, I like personally like this. I say it's a necessity, not everyone likes it. What it is, is instead of carrying five gallons of boiling hot water by yourself, you know, that's kind of heavy. What I like to do is slowly empty it into the trans you know, transmission vessel so it gets light and then I'll pour the rest in. So it's worth a 50 cent investment in my book. What we got here is a, um, a air bubbler. What that does is for a fermenting process. Another thing you got to have. I'm not going to use it just now, but when it comes time to ferment, we will be using it. The sanitizer of choice, Star Sand. You might have seen it in some of our other videos. Do not use bleach. That's a golden rule in my book. Star Sand is your best friend as a brewer. Keeps everything sanitized. If there's some less left in there, it can mix with the beer. It's not going to hurt anything, and it kills all the bacteria. Always have Star Sand. And here's the carboy we're going to be using today. As you can see, it's filled with this cloudy water. That's just simply star sand and faucet water from out, out there. You know, it's, you can mix with anything. I, I always keep it fully sanitized before I put the beer in the wort because I, the longer you keep it sanitized and the shorter time of sanitization to beer, it's going to be better for you. Auto siphon, not necessary, but I just bought one a couple brews back and it makes it life a lot easier. Instead of making a siphon for a hand, this thing, you just simply pump it and you automatically create a siphon. Really simple stuff. There's a transmission bucket because we got to at some point transfer from the igloo cooler back to the pot. Always have an extra bucket or two on hand. I have a couple lying around but this is my preference one. I also have other ones that are dedicated for other things. Um, I got about two or three tubings right here. These are all great you know, for transferring back and forth. I always put two or three right for a batch just to have them on, on hand. And finally, for cooling down the beer, because you're gonna have five gallons of 212 degree water, well, how are you gonna cool that down without an ice, or you can do an ice bath, but that takes a lot of time, a lot of ice, it's a pain in the butt. I just use a copper coil, run faucet water from the you know, 70 degree faucet water, cools it down pretty much to where you need it to be, and it works out pretty well. Um, that's pretty much it for all the necessity stuff. Over here in the corner, I have a bunch of random other things, like random buckets, strainers, cleaners and stuff. But in my book, this is all you absolutely need to do all grain brewing. Uh, it's probably going to run you, depending on me, this is all to me about 125, 150. But again, I got a free burner for my dad, a free pot. That probably will run you 50 to 100 bucks if you're buying brand new. Um, this came with my kit. This came with the kit I bought, my initial extract kit that I bought for 100 bucks. So these initially came from it. So I didn't have to you know, buy this just for all grain. It was transferable. $20 cooler, $20 to $30 spigot right here. Um, you know, Star Sand is 10 bucks, but this stuff will last you six months to a year, depending on how much you brew. And that's pretty much it. I mean, we'll, you know, so under 150 bucks, you can have a, a full all grain setup and start doing whatever beer you want to do. All right, sounds good. Let's get brewing. Cool. All right. So propane's going. Ideally, we're looking ahead about 145 degrees resting temperature. So you're going to want to raise the water to 150 to 155 because the coldness of the grain is going to offset that temp a couple degrees. So what we're going to do is rest for 15 minutes at 145 degrees with this first part of it. Alright, so we got our water to uh, 145 degrees. So we're ready to transfer the hot water into the mash tun and add some grains to it. But I always like to add some water on the bottom first so you're not having just grain settled there, you know. It helps it. So we'll take this off. And this is when I use this because even though it's only four and a half gallons of water, that's still pretty heavy in my book for boiling, you know, pretty hot water. Just kind of transfer this. I 
do about two or three. Get them in there. So it's about a gallon of water into there. And we're gonna take, we got two bags of grains here, so I'm probably just gonna take the first bag I grab. Open it right up. As you can see, there's lots of grains sitting in there. Just pour them right in. Spill a little bit, it's all right. Now what I do is I put a little more water on top just to distribute it, and I'm going to stir around a little bit now after I put another batch or two of this water on there. Okay, you see I'm just stirring around here. It smells beautiful. It smells like a really nice grain. Yeah, it There's smells some awesome. Nice, nice foam head coming up. That's the proteins of the of the grains and the sugars mixing. Now we got all the rest of the grains in. It's still pretty dry, but we got more water to add on top. But just showing you, you know, it's pretty full to the brim on a five gallon. Uh, Mixing around, just distributing the grains and the sugars and the proteins. All right, well, we're just finishing up what we call the mash process, which is just mixing that, you know, 145 degree water in this case with the grains, the extract, those sugars, the proteins, the starches. And as you can see back there, um, there's all that bubbling. That's just, you know, the sugars and everything mending together. So generally I stir for five, maybe 10 minutes, which I'm just about done with. And then I'm going to take this top, seal it, let it sit for as long as it needs to sit. And that's pretty simple. And for this recipe, we're doing a couple different mashes. So this one's going to sit for at least 15 minutes in this first batch. Is that accurate? Yes. That is 15 minutes for this one, and then there's a couple other times for the rest of them. All right. Well, we'll Same see you all in about 15 minutes. All, of them. all right. So we let the grains in the 135 degree water sit for 15, 20 minutes. We're doing what's called a bat sparge method. There's fly sparging, other variations, but I like bat sparging because I think it yields a good efficiency of the amount of sugar you get out of that grain. And I'm lazy, so for me it works because just let's sit in the cooler, go do something, go do wash the dishes, whatever you feel like doing. Drink a beer, that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> and you, know, you just let sit, and then um, you just basically pull the, uh, pull the sugar water out of it, which that's basically wort right there, which is a uh, unfermented beer without pops or yeast out of it yet. So, as you can see, we didn't yield a lot, but those grains absorbed a lot of the water that we already put in there. Uh, we're gonna do this two or three more times for this specific beer. Some beers only take one or two sparges. It, it all depends on the recipe. So we're gonna do this a couple more times, and then uh, we'll be boiling up some beer soon. All right, so we're on our, we finished our fourth and final mash. So now we got all of our wort, AKA sugar water, done. We're gonna pour it right into here. And now we're gonna start the boil process, which is a 60 minute boil for this batch. And we're gonna let it steep and then pour some hops in. And we're gonna start making some beer. All right, so now we're at the start of our 60 minute boil. This step, the, uh, we're gonna put some, the 60 minute hops in. We have another batch later we're gonna do, but this is the 60 minute challenger hops we're putting in the batch. And uh, let's get it started. Just pour them right in. Oh man, it smells beautiful. So now that we got the first batch of hops in, we're gonna come back at about the 40 minute mark to add the second batch for this particular recipe. So uh, I guess we'll see you then. So we're 20 minutes out from cool down of the beer. So we're gonna add our second batch of, what are these? Sterian Golding Hops. They're gonna add a lot of flavor, some of the aroma. You know, it's gonna be a lot of the not bitter flavors you're gonna get from a hop. So we're choosing these, these hops right here. Adding them in, pop them right in. Stir them up. All right, so we're gonna add this uh, Belgian Dark Premium Candy Syrup, which for a Bernardus is kind of essential. So, we're going to support right in. We're about 15 minutes out in our boil process. And as you can see, it's a super thick syrup. It's going to add a lot of sweetness, a lot of body. Anything you're going to expect from a St. Bernard's, you're going to get from this syrup. It's one of the essential things. Get that last bit in. So at the final part in our brewing process, we got about 15, 10 minutes out, and then we'll uh, cool down the beer and we'll be done making this beer. All right, so we've uh, finished our boiling time and now we're gonna cool the beer down. I have an immersion chiller, which is essentially a copper coil. 
hooked up to the faucet right there, as you can see. And what this is just going to do is run 70, well, in Florida, 70 degree water through this coil, out the end. So I'm going to do this. You can see, and this end goes out here. That's where all the hot, bad water goes. All right, so we've cooled the wort down to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about as good as it's gonna get in Florida. So now we gotta go to a secondary system using an ice bucket, elevate it so that it can push the water down, cool the wort down to 70 degrees, and get it to a pitchable yeast temperature. So now we've uh, cooled the wort down to 75 degrees, which is yeast pitching temperature and we're going to transfer it to the carboy, which is where we're going to uh, have the wort ferment for three to four weeks typically. And then um, that's where the yeast is going to make, you know, eat the sugar of the beer and make the carbonation. All right, so as you can see, the uh, fermenter is pretty much filled so the next step, we're going to be pitching the yeast. For this beer, we got a lot of uh, gravity. So we're going to put two packets in just to make sure we got enough fermentation early on because the longer you wait for fermentation, the more bacteria can possibly grow. So we're doing two packets for this one. All right, so now we've pitched our yeast. We need to aerate it a bit for a, you know, a few minutes just to like get the oxygen mixed with the yeast. What that does is allows a healthier yeast, it, it wakes it up more or less, and lets the beer ferment really early on, which is ideal for home brewing. All right, so we pitched the yeast into this bad boy. What we're gonna do now is let this sit for three weeks at 83 degrees thereabouts. Every recipe is different. And then after that three weeks, we're gonna we're gonna transfer this to a secondary fermenter at 50 degrees for eight weeks, and that's gonna really let the beer mature, carbonate well, you know, make it a nice quad where it should be. And then we're gonna transfer to bottles, which we're gonna wait about four to six months to drink, because that's really where the Belgians age at. So this concludes the St. Bernard's 12 clone. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Please comment. And we'll definitely put up a video whenever we crack that bad boy open and drink it. Thank you. Beer is good. Beer is good. Beer is good. And some beer is good. Beer is good. Beer is good. Let's go drink some beer. Beer.